Hey, what's going on guys? It's Jack. Back in to break down the plus 18 Dawnbreaker that Neve had chested just recently. He's a very high-end Dis Priest for a number of years. He was one of the first Dis Priests to actually kill Mythic Anzarek. And he's been, of course, pushing high keys for quite a long time. So here I want to show off some of the things that he was doing and some of the things the group was doing in order to chest this dungeon and hopefully give you guys some good tips along the way that you could apply to some of your own groups. First things first, one of the things I like about his UI is how he sort of like boxes and categorizes different things. You're going to see crowd control both for interrupts and for AOE crowd control abilities like Blinding Slee or Capacitor Totem. It's all in that middle right side box off to the side. So if he ever wants to look at what is available, he can always laser focus it into right there. Underneath his raid frames, he has Omni CD and he pared it down and he trimmed it down to just having defensives for your tank, defensives for your players and for the offensive, like the utility oriented things, having the rescue, having the dispels, things along those lines. And then only one offensive ability in Ascendance and in Breath of Sindragosa for the DPS players. This makes it a lot easier to be able to see when trash packs are gonna die, when big cooldowns are available and hopefully it'll be a little bit easier for you to follow along as they're doing some of these pulls. You can even see on the very big lust pull that they do once they get onto the boat, that the external bar at the bottom of his screen starts getting utilized very, very quickly. Unfortunately, there's this shadow mage that can appear off to the side, which can very easily start bolting players if you're not careful. That's always an area where you might need like an extra DK grip or just an extra shutdown. Cleave naturally starts going off onto those mobs. And with all the tormenting ray damage that's happening, which is insanely difficult to heal through, that's the area where all of these externals start coming into play with both pain subs being utilized, AMZ being utilized, their spell warding being utilized from the prop paladin, and they're also playing Lightsmith, so you'll occasionally start seeing the, some of the holy bulwarks getting thrown out onto allies to help shield them and provide a little bit of assistance to the healer along the way. As they start jumping onto the boats, it's very important to watch for those bursting cocoons that are getting tossed out by some of the lieutenant mobs. This is by far the most deadly mob on regardless of what difficulty level that you're doing. And the ticking damage of those bursting cocoons is incredibly high. And there's another burst of damage that's going on after the fact. So the team has been consistently sort of rotating through a lot of their cooldowns and large defensives. And there's no way to really like stop it from going on to certain players. And so as a result, you kind of need some off healing, some support at the highest of key levels to deal with it. But if you're using it in your own groups, you'll even see moments where Neve is shielding himself or shielding one of the other players with the cocoon at the last second so that he's getting the effective health as high as possible, sometimes even like defensive penancing or flash healing or allowing atonement healing to push health pools up and then using a beefy shield at the very end of the duration so that the health pool is as large as possible, the shield adds on more effective health and so you're mitigating as much of that burst on that single target as you possibly can. The easiest part of this 18 Dawnbreaker has got to be the first boss, of course. One of the cool things that he is taking advantage of is timing his squid and timing his mind blast to go alongside the dispel. This may not be as important at like lower key levels, but it's something that's really noticeable at higher key levels as the dispel mechanic is going to trigger negative absorbs on everybody and it's also going to put out some ticking damage. And so every single time he's timing his mind blast, at least if not his squid, then his mind blast, then his radiance as the dispel is about to happen, triggering that dispel, triggering a big healing absorb on everyone, and then blasting damage to push up all of the health bars. Whenever there's moments where there's really big healing required, he's first hitting the squid, then the mind blast, and then the radiance. It's always what you want to do when you know there's like planned damage and there's like focused damage. There's a few different times, especially on trash pulls, where you're kind of just sending out your void wraith or sending out your mind blast as you can, since damage can be frequent and like inconsistent on some different targets. It might happen in like a big burst and then kind of settle down. And so you're constantly, constantly just trying to build up towards the next 
uh, Void Wraith to be able to send it whenever you possibly can. There's even some moments where the big burst damage out of an 18 can be very lethal for your tanks. And there's even a moment where Ardent Defender actually procs and saves the prop paladin's life and making sure that he is able to survive it. A couple times later, then they start using pain suppressions to allow him to hold on to some cooldowns as they're gonna get themselves ready for some of the trash pulls below. Once they kill off the first boss, then they're going into the front of the church where they're doing this gigantic pull where they're gathering together three of the Void Wraiths from the front of the church and from like the alley leading up towards it. This is a very increasingly popular pull that is coming around lately. And it also means that there's a ton of debuffs going out onto people similar to the mini boss debuffs that are getting focused out. And so what they're doing is they're laser focusing one of these shadows down as quick as they can to start reducing some of the damage that's gonna happen as they drop to lower health. And so they laser focus one of them down and then Neeb actually saves up his Void Wraith for a few seconds and then brings it back, starts using it as those last two shadows are at lower levels of health. They rip AMZ, they rip Zephyr, he pops all of his output cooldowns and Void Wraith and Mind Blast and starts pounding damage to make sure that these manifested shadows are not going to kill off the group with the huge AoE damage that they're going to be putting out. Also at this time, they start noticing their Lust cooldown. And this is what happens in a lot of high-end groups is they start kind of playing around that Lust cooldown whenever it is present. That is going to be their sign that they need to go to specific mini bosses because some are much much deadlier than others and in this case it's going to be the orb the dark orb mini boss down by the Meraldar town it can tack i believe the name of it of the mini bosses this is by far the most deadly and you're frequently going to see everybody using lust on this big cooldowns to bring it down as rapidly as you can and as a healer it's also really challenging to deal with because of the debuffs happening from the abyssal blast going out onto players at the same time that you're having these big aoe explosions even if you are perfectly kiting out that dark orb aiming it so it's not going to crash into any nearby walls and sending it away as far as possible that dot damage is still obscenely obscenely high and so what the group is doing from the range perspective is they're also kind of standing back further to see if they have the option of line of sighting behind some of the, the walls for the town and making sure that if they don't have defensives or externals like pain suppression you're going to see these on cooldown very frequently throughout that is going to be the area where they're going to lean on it and you can even see the longer that this pull goes the more deadly that it is and that actually leads to the first death of the group when you kind of just run out of defensive cooldowns you're forced into a position where you need to line a sight and then if you don't then those debuffs can just kill you outright the church mini boss is much less deadly and they bring it inside the church and also make it so that the range can start standing almost in like the doorway leading up to the church to make it that much easier to line of sight again when they don't have defensive cooldowns. What they do with the Abyssal Blast is they try to prioritize it onto the Death Knight when they can, continuously line of sighting and avoiding the dot debuff until it selects the DK. Then he's able to use AMS, completely mitigate that damage, and then everybody starts running back in. This makes it so much easier to deal with and even if the DK doesn't have AMS he's usually way tankier than everybody else from the damage side and it is very easy for them just to start slamming down some death strikes to be able to heal themselves so regardless what group you're in if you know you don't have any defensives it might just be better to continuously LOS this debuff to make sure that it goes out onto somebody else who is tankier the final mini boss is ridiculously big AOE damage and also is putting out Abyssal Blasts on top of it. But this is also a lot easier to plan for for some of the big AOE damage that's happening since it's going to be on very consistent timers. The challenge really just comes onto the player that is afflicted with the Abyssal Blast and might have to also deal with some of that large AoE damage. This is a big area for Prop Paladin as the Spell Warding, the Hand of Sacrifice, some of the off shielding from Lightsmith, all are able to make such a big impact in keys and throwing those to the right targets that are afflicted by those Abyssal Blasts. There also is the opportunity to use some line of sight tech and there's even a moment where they're trying to get a little bit of extra line of sight value and they have to end up just slamming the kitchen sink in of cooldowns to keep people alive who are getting affected by these abyssal blasts. There's some ridiculous damage, but with this composition of the evoker, of the shaman, of the paladin, and of course with the DK, there's a lot of 
off cooldowns or off utility that can be utilized to mitigate both the AoE damage and the single target damage that's coming out onto their allies. One of the things I love that Neeb does is he also makes sure that he's using Renew in downtime to maintain his Gala Shadow stacks. Gala Shadows is built up by periodic effects, which is Purge the Wicked and, of course, Renew. And so whenever you're not in combat, just putting up that Renew as you're flying to the next location is a great way to maintain that huge intellect buff that you have on hand. And he's also taking advantage of Rapture and not sending out all the shields immediately, but kind of using them sparingly and rolling with that debuff so that he's then able to always have some huge shields, which can also get buffed by our tier set bonus from your smites and penances to be even larger and even more clutch. Anubakaj is absolutely one of the hardest bosses in the game at the moment, but since the damage pattern is usually very consistent, it makes it very easy for Disc Priest to be able to prepare. One of the biggest things, though, that I notice is you are sending your cooldowns way earlier than you might be expecting, and Neeb really highlights it here on the fight, where you're going to have the Dark Orb coming out first, then you're going to have the Tank Buster, then you're going to have the Shadowy Decay. And what he ends up doing is already having his Void Wraith out, already having his Rift out before the Shadowy Decay cast actually gets going. And he's using single target Atonement Healing to actually spread onto the group and start lightly sort of topping players off from that orb damage. And then he starts using those double radiances to be able to push up health pools as he needs to. Keep in mind, he's running the standard Harsh Discipline setup because you really need to be able to have this burst AoE on plus 18 because those are the biggest things that are going to be killing you here. At around a minute and a half into the fight, this is when you're going to get the combo effect of having the Dark Orb happen right into the Shadowy Decay. And so how he responds to this is he actually is using his Void Wraith right as the orb is actually getting sent out. And so he does it super incredibly early so that he is going to have all of his resources, all of his real preparation abilities sent on the boss, ticking away from the very beginning. You can even see, see him setting up his Fade, Desperate Prayer, Protective Light, the works, so that he has all of this output possible and ready to go. And he has his Rift detonate basically at the very last second as the Shadowy Decay damage is actually going to be ending. This is a huge, huge part of the fight where basically everybody has to use every single cooldown just to make sure that you live. And because the boss is on an 18, they actually have it happen again at the very end of the fight, but thankfully, they're that much more secure because they have discs execute to be able to help them along the way. So almost every single time that they have some of these AoEs going out, they're rotating between a combination of personals or with some big AoE cooldowns on hand. So you'll often see when AMZ gets used by the DK, he's not hitting his AMS on top of it. Just having one cooldown or one defensive from the DPS players is enough for one of these AoEs. And they specifically are using absorbs like AMS or Stone Bulwark Totem after the AoE goes off from the orb. Having yourself at 100% and then absorbing the dark orb damage, and then there's a bunch of downtime, and then the shadowy decay starts, usually is not very productive for the healer. And so making sure they have those absorb type defensives used specifically for shadowy decay makes all the difference in the world. When it comes to planning some of your cooldowns, I'd always recommend trying to use your barrier before you get into execute range. But what the group is doing at this level is they're just constantly sending their abilities, their defensives in a rotation as quickly as they often get them back. And so it happens that barrier comes up while he's already in execute range and you can already see just how safe the entire team is as a result. The boss fight actually ends with another combination happening at like 345 in the encounter. And since there's so much damage happening through it, they just have to end up sending spell warding out onto the healer, which can make it pretty difficult going into the last of the mini bosses as they get back on the Dawnbreaker. The Architect mini boss is really, really challenging, but the bright side of it is that you have about a 15, 16 second window to be able to prep your Mind Blast or your Void Wraith each and every time. And so what ends up happening is you start again, kind of looking at the defensives that are available to you. And Neeb starts looking at where are the areas that he can send out his Rift nice and early. It's also a really big benefit having power infusion when you are casting with big CDs up because it's also going to give you more cooldown reduction, not only for your squid, 
mid, but also for your rift. And so what ends up happening is he quickly chains one rift into another with the additional cooldown reduction that power infusion will end up giving to your mind blast as a hasted cooldown, making it that much easier to be able to set up another burst of healing for the next tormented eruption. While he is using shields and the surge procs that he's getting to be able to sort of supplement some of the healing when he needs to, when targets don't have a full-fledged defensive on him, he's also trusting in his smites and void blasts to do enough healing when players do have those defensives on hand. And this is also allowing him to get much better Shadow Covenant uptime than if he was casting a lot of healing spells onto them and not being able to get the smites in to build up for the next Void Wraith cast. One of the most important things on the final boss is, of course, how you're setting up your defensives and sort of cycling through them with the group. What they end up doing is actually sending Zephyr very early on and having some light defensives getting utilized, low cooldown defensives getting utilized nice and early. This is really, really beneficial as you can start desyncing a lot of the defensives that the party has. And you can also make sure that you're holding some of the biggest defensives for that are not going to end up being back. Something like spell warding, for example, barrier as another, you would only really be able to have a little bit later on in the encounter, but things like Zephyr and AMZ, you can use early and then be able to have later on down the line. The same principle applies here on it as does Anubakaj, where he's sending his Void Wraith and then sending his Mind Blast and following it up with the Radiance and slamming huge amounts of damage and just turreting and making sure that he's getting those Void Blast casts off. This is a hugely, hugely important part of the fight as it makes all the difference in the world in getting that cooldown reduction onto your allies and just being able to pump enough AoE output. They actually end up finishing that first phase with everybody getting their defensives back off cooldown since they send them so early. And it makes it all that much easier for everybody in the group to really just start pumping damage while also ensuring that they're gonna have the major defensives that they need back for when Roshanan actually drops. One of the best ways to really organize the defensives is highlighted by how they are organizing themselves on the spinneret strands versus some of the erosive AoEs. When they have spinneret strands going out onto certain players, they're using AMS, they're using obsidian scales, they're using those personals, and they're often getting pre-shielded by Neeb right as those damage effects are happening. He's also even pre-positioning himself for the evoker to verdant embrace to him so they can kind of jump out and also trigger a heal in the process to make it that much easier for everybody to get out of these strands as fast as they possibly can and be in the right position to stack up once the erosive sprays are going to be coming. So what the healer is doing, what Neeb is doing, is he's not sending his Void Wraith or his Mind Blast to heal the Spinneret Strand damage. He's playing it very similarly to Anubakaj, where he's setting up his Void Wraith and Mind Blast a little bit in advance of the erosive spray, so that way he is going to more easily pump that damage, top everybody from that Spinneret Strand, but also be blasting full damage as the erosive spray is happening and sending that penance very early as the damage is starting to stack up so that way everybody will be in a much healthier position once the next round of strands is happening they're constantly cycling between barrier amz zephyr the works and of course some of the personal defensives if they have them some of the small things like rescue shields are really really valuable at this point because everybody can be stacked and then of course some of the larger defensives that are single target based Sack from the Paladin, Pain Suppression from the Priest are getting put on the players running out those spinneret strands. Each and every time that the spray actually falls off, that's really the time to start taking stock of what defensives people have on hand, what they might really be using to get themselves set up. And there's a number of moments where you have that opportunity to start weaving slow rapture shields in. And that's something that Neeb does to great effect to be able to start putting up a couple of shields on people before the spray is going out or before the strands are going out, and then still having a few more shields on the back end that you can then use for who whoever is going to be taking those strands, moving them out of the group, and then keeping them safe from that huge burst of damage that's gonna go out onto that individual. In situations where he has to make priorities between shielding like the DK and somebody else, keeping in mind how much tankier the DK is, 
and how much easier it is for them to heal themselves since they can drop some of the strands really close to melee and also use death strike makes it a lot easier for them to start prioritizing shields onto the enhanced shaman or onto the evoker as the evoker especially can be very very squishy when they don't have their cooldowns and their defensives on hand they finish this instance with like 15 seconds to spare and so literally any other death besides the two that they ended up having would have been the end for them this is an insanely insanely good run and you got to give some huge props to Neve and the boys for getting this one down. Big thanks to Neve, of course, for sharing his footage with me on this one. I'll link his content as well in the description down below in his original video where he goes pull by pull on everything. Highly recommend you guys check him out as well. And of course, huge thank you to our patrons for making all of this content possible. If you'd like to join and check it out, get access to new videos, it'll be in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll catch you all next time.